Welcome back to Champions League Takeaway here on Ranks FC. It's great to be back here on a Wednesday night discussing the Champions League. We've had a few weeks with just one pod in the feed, but we're back with a secondary one because the Champions League quarterfinals first legs are done and dusted. My name is Jack Collins and I'll be your host today. And joining me is the rank on Mr. Sam Tai. How you doing, mate? Yes, very well. Thank you, mate. Very well indeed. Enjoyed the action. Already can't wait for next week. But before we do that, we should probably sum up everything we've seen. Looks like my rankings are on the funeral pyre. They've been <laughs> pronounced dead by several <laughs> listeners. And to be honest, I don't blame them. Yes, no, very much so. Very much so. Also with us for this first part for the game between Real Madrid and Chelsea, it's our transfer agreement, Mr. Dean Jones. How you doing, mate? Okay, mate. Yeah, like Sam, I've had a bit of stick off people for me saying City wouldn't get past by and um, battered him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> never mind. <laughs> these things happen. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. we get these things right. Sometimes we get them wrong. This is one very that I wrong. got right. So I'm going to sit here yeah. very smugly while we start this. Right. Yet. There's plenty to get through. No, it's not over yet. You're absolutely right. We'll come to that game uh, in a little while, but we're going to start with tonight's fix. Is the Wednesday night games. And we're going to start with Real Madrid versus Chelsea 2-0 to Real at the Bernabeu. And Dean, well, this one did go as we thought it might do. Yes, lads, I'll, I'll be focusing on this one tonight. Real Madrid 2, Chelsea 0. It's literally just ended. Um, goals from Benzema and Asensio. I think he scored with his first touch. I'm not entirely sure about that, but he had just come on. Um, he has scored with his first touch at least once before. So I think it's just kind of got his locker and he does it, these he's things. He's got a bit of a habit of scoring very quickly after he comes on, doesn't he? <laughs> Loves it. Loves it. It's a very handy trait to have. Um, look, the the BT pundits here in England are trying to play up Chelsea's chances and their performance here um, on the back of this game. I'm not sure if it's because they had a really good chat with Frank Lampard just before the game. They don't want to upset him. Um, I'm struggling a little bit to be honest, to be optimistic from a Chelsea point of view, but I will give it a crack. And that's where I'm going to begin at number three. So Lampard's tactics for this game, to be fair to him, he will probably have good reason to be disappointed that Xiao Felix didn't give them the lead very early on. It was a fantastic chance through on goal, didn't make the most of it. And actually, even beyond that, Chelsea did play with a reasonably nice balance um, for the start of this game. And Lampard, he began his, his lineup. He had Thiago Silva in there at the back. He had N'Golo Kante in midfield and he had Raheem Sterling up front. Now, the reason for this was Lampard felt they needed experience and it was going to be vital on this stage. He needed those players through the, the spine of his team to give them, well, probably a nous that they've really lacked um, for a lot, a lot of this season. We know that Chelsea haven't scored many goals. I think it's actually the fourth game in a row they haven't scored a goal. But, um, he was hoping that that experience would lead them to an unexpected win in the Bernabeu. Honestly, for 15 minutes or so, that was fine. But he also used a three at the back and wing backs. And honestly, they just didn't have any idea, it seemed, of how to progress the ball from the back into the areas that would exploit dangers. Um, Enzo Fernandez. His, um, his movement was pretty good. Everyone else, honestly, I'm struggling with this big time. I'm really struggling. The top two, Sterling and Jao Felix, there just was barely anything there. Um, a couple of glimpses, but just nothing like the movement that you need to help you find space and openings against a team like this. And yeah, it just didn't have any adaptation or in-game management that could have changed this. I was like, obviously Lampard against Ancelotti is a big problem from the get-go. It was never going to be a strength of Lampard to win this game as an ongoing tactical battle. But Chelsea yeah. fans must have been so frustrated watching it unravel because the patterns of play and the working out of the back on the just never really reflected the optimism they might have had from looking at the starting lineup and the tactical setup where you were thinking, do you know what? With Thiago Silva in the centre of a back three, playing with those wing backs, having those three in the middle and an experienced top two, 
actually, this looks all right for a game like this. I've got some hope that we can get out here with this game alive. And the fact that also Real Madrid didn't put anything like a 10 out of 10 performance out. Chelsea barely gave them anything to worry about all night. They had a good chance, as I said, at the very start. And Mason Mount had a good one right at the very end. In between, lads, there really wasn't a lot. And, and it's a shame from a Chelsea point of view because in the early stages, there was hope there. And it just faded, as I say, beyond those first 15 minutes. Just wasn't there. Yeah. I think there's something really interesting in this, in that when you're when you're talking about the, the way that Chelsea set up, and especially as you say for those first 15 minutes, it felt like there was a bit of back and forth. That there were there were times where Felix and where Sterling as well were able to get the ball and move into those front areas and actually get beyond the defensive line and test Real Madrid's you know ability on the turn and ability to chase them in those areas in behind. As soon as Real Madrid scored that first goal, the entire nous of the game changed and. Chelsea didn't change with it whatsoever because there was that element then of Real Madrid were like, well, come on then, come at us and we'll just sit mm -hmm. here and hit you on the counter. And the way that Chelsea struggled after that first Real Madrid goal, I don't think is any coincidence. I don't think it's any coincidence whatsoever. That what we're saying is Chelsea started well when it was nil-nil. It was a bit cat and mouse. You have to go for it. There has to be an element of, of, of kind of chasing that first goal and getting in the lead. But as soon as Real Madrid have that, there was no reason for them to go absolutely pounding after a second because they knew that Chelsea would have to come out them. And it meant at that point that Felix and Sterling were so isolated, I thought, that as soon as they got the ball in that in that third, Real Madrid nicked it off them and off they went again. And, and there was nothing in Chelsea's game plan to kind of adapt for that situation, I thought. Yeah, I mean, that kind of leads me into number two, um, which is the intensity that both teams played with was a big difference in this game. Madrid had loads of it. Chelsea had very little of it. Quite surprising, really. Like, parts of this match were actually quite open, more open than I would have expected. And from a Chelsea point of view, that just didn't work out very well. Um, the one thing you felt coming into the game that Chelsea would have to do was, at the very least, match Madrid's work rate and commitment. It's a very basic element of the game. And from a Frank Lampard team, it really is one of the, the foundations of a, a performance that you'd expect one of his teams to put in. And they didn't have it, lads. And um, Madrid absolutely coasted it. The TV commentary here in England described this as a flat performance from Madrid and that they were doing nothing special and that Chelsea shouldn't really have anything to fear going into the second leg. And that's a very positive spin to put on the fact that Madrid really didn't have to do a lot in this game to actually win it. The yeah. Bernabeu, yes, was flat. That's because it was pretty boring for them to watch this game unravel. They were never going to lose. And they won't lose this tie overall unless Chelsea can produce something that none of us can see coming at the moment. And actually, the Chilwell red card that came on just before the hour mark is a really good example of this intensity that I felt was lacking. The players, for too many periods of this game, from a Chelsea point of view, were happy to go through the motions. And there's this part of the game, and I think the keeper rolls it out. Chelsea have just been on the attack. And Madrid's midfield, I just sat in their own half, about halfway in, just in front of the edge of the, the centre circle. And they're, they're just standing there, passing it to each other. Enzo, Kante, Kovacic are standing off them. They're letting them do it. So as Madrid slowly advance, they're still in their own half. The ball's played forward once. The ball comes back in. And then Valverde spots that Rodrigo's got a hole to spin into. It's straight off the back of Kukurea, who, to be fair to him, has only just come on as a substitute for Koulibaly. Um, he's not in the rhythm of the game at all. I mean, he hasn't really been much of the rhythm of the season, to be fair to him. Um, but Rodrigo sees it. It's the tiniest movement. Spins off his shoulder. Cucurella's dead. And as he's about to get into the box, uh, Chilwell pulls him back, gets the red card. Look, it, it was honestly, it's like, why are the three of you just sat, why are you content to just sit there, let Real Madrid have the ball there right now? Not one of you is, is pushing. Look, Kovacic has, has, hasn't a, a great time recently, I don't think. I don't think his performance levels have been that good. Kante obviously hasn't had that much game time. Enzo was probably Chelsea's best player on the night and is consistently going to be that because of the levels he's been playing at anyway. But yeah, it's very strange that 
such a basic element that should have been there for Chelsea was lacking. So when they then flip it and say, well, this game isn't dead. Chelsea have got a lot there to fight for in the second leg. I'm like, but have they? Because they're lacking such a fundamental element of being able to beat such a good team. The scary bit here is that yeah. Real Madrid can get a lot better. Chelsea arguably maybe can't. So that's yeah. that's that's unfortunately the spin of it. Um, Dean, I wanted to ask you, obviously I was not watching this game, um, to specifically on Kante, you know, hasn't played very much. They didn't risk him at the weekend, obviously wanted to get him in for tonight. How did he get on? And look, he was okay. I, I, I couldn't give him much beyond that. I mean, I, I don't necessarily think that this was his fault. I'd say Kovacic was worse than him and Enzo did all right. But Kante, I think, struggled with the, the setup of this team. I don't think in front of him he had anything to bounce off of. Like the, the, run, the runs weren't there for him to ever look up and try to play into. And I think equally, the balls that he might have expected to be coming out of the back weren't there either. So at times he was dropping really deep to try to look for the ball to try and get things going. But typically Enzo's in there anyway trying to do that. So that, that hole doesn't really exist for him anymore. And obviously Kante isn't at the moment the full box-to-box -box midfielder we were once getting because he's just coming back, right? So he was okay, mate, but you need more than Kante. Like I can totally understand he did take him off in the end, but Thiago was never ready to play 90 in the Bernabeu. Kante's not ready to play 90 in the Bernabeu. They were always going to struggle at some point in the game, but they struggled for longer than they probably should have had to. And it doesn't make any sense to me. All in yeah, all... I saw an account on Twitter, Talking yeah. Tactics, one of those big, big tactic accounts. And they said, yeah. Chelsea's players look like Manchester United under Ralph Rangnick, disinterested <laughs> and barely breaking out of a jog. It's a sentiment I've seen thrown around a little bit on Twitter already. It, it's not a great vibe considering Lampard was supposed to no. be a little bit of energy and a little bit of bounce for this team and, and not much more than that. You, you weren't looking at him to rescue them on a tactical level. You were looking for a bit yeah. of, you know, give them a bit of igniting spark. And, and that being the case is not seemingly what's going on. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? You know, Lampard brought in to try and help them through this this period in time, which is, which is tricky enough as it is. But... He's now had two games as, as manager of Chelsea. He's lost to Wolves and he's lost to Real Madrid. And he's now looking at a home fixture against Brighton at the weekend that comes before the next match against Real Madrid. So before this game, I was thinking, how's he going to rotate his team for that Brighton match? What's he going to do there? Now, he's going to have to rotate. Like, Rhys James can't keep playing these minutes that he's playing. Kante can't keep you this amount of time. Before the match, he even said he wasn't sure exactly how long he was going to get out of Thiago Silva. There's so many problems in this Chelsea team right now. And honestly, I look at that fixture against Brighton. I mean, I'm tempted to stick the mortgage on Brighton at the moment. I want to see how I feel about that in the morning. Better have a chat with Taylor about that before I do it. But um, <laughs> it, it, I, I was kind of joking when Lampard took the job when I looked through the fixtures and said, I'm not sure, apart from Nottingham Forest, I can see I'm getting a win here. <laughs> not sure they're going to beat Nottingham Forest. Anyway, it, was, it was, was the mismatch. Yeah. It was the mismatch we expected, lads. But but number one is is like, to talk about what was good about Real Madrid, was that if Chelsea did lack energy overall, then, then Madrid didn't lack that. And it was largely because Valverde and Vinny had that spark and that it was, it was just game-defining. Like, their elite players were able to feel the game out, win their own battles without being majestic. But these two were at it tonight. And Valverde in particular, like the energy levels of him were crazy. He also was getting himself into awkward positions, advanced positions at times that Chelsea struggled to track. They didn't know who should be going into those gaps that he wanted to find. He's really good actually in games like this uh, at making the opposition think, put him on the back foot basically at, at difficult times in the game and just changing the, the feel of a performance. He made Chelsea's failing show up even more, to be honest. He was he was a standout performer in this game. Now, Benzema will probably get a lot of the headlines because he scored again against Chelsea, but he's basically doing his job and converting a chance that's fallen on his lap. But again, it's, it's Vinny that we have to talk about as well. Like, at times he was just killing... 
Rhys James, he was rinsing Fafana. I think the last time I did one of these Real Madrid recaps, I, I put in Vinicius Junior at number one as the reason that Real Madrid are the scariest <laughs> and the main reason they won the game. But even if I did do that, it's, it's not going to change me me putting him into this position again here. Um, he forced the first goal, had the layoff for the second goal. He just, it feels like he lives for these nights, to be honest with you. Um, all round performance, like it wasn't one of his best, but those sparks that that verve that he's got in him to make things happen, it just showed you that like that that elitism isn't currently in this Chelsea team. Sterling doesn't have it. Felix doesn't have it. Havertz doesn't have it. Mudrick, I don't know where he is. Like none of them have it, right? Like the, all the players that should have should be able to create that for Chelsea. X factor, yeah. Yeah, it's not there. It's not there. And as I say, Vinny and Valverde for me, like that, that was on the night when Madrid could go through the motions, didn't produce a special performance. It was largely because they've got a couple of players like this that couldn't just turn it on and make the difference. Yeah, 100%. hundred percent. It just feels like there's those moments. And like you say, when Vinny feels like he's that player on these kind of nights, that is the Galactico Real Madrid moment, isn't it? It's it's these players that yeah. come alive on these Champions League nights, on the big nights. The ones that ha have, have won them the Champions League so many times in recent years have been those players yeah. who might not be having the best game in the world, but can make things happen on a sixpence. And Vinicius very much, of all the players on this side, feels like one of those and that's an incredible thing considering he's playing with some veterans and legends of the game who have done this so many times right now he feels like he's the one that can make this type cyclic into gear and that's that's a pretty cool position to be in for Vinicius I think yeah yeah he's probably one of the reasons I still think Real Madrid probably win this competition then there were two just you and I Sam to go through these last two three games three games we normally break after two we've only done one so far uh, but it felt like a big one but I'm looking forward to talking about this next one which was Milan beating Napoli 1-0 at San Siro I told you didn't I I said during the preview we went live on YouTube on Wednesday afternoon I said Jack We've been talking about this game for 10, 15 minutes now and everything you've been saying to me, I'm starting to get this feeling that Milan are going to get something out of this game and it, and it proved to be the case. It's it's a huge victory and a huge first half of the tie for AC Milan, 1-0 at home to Napoli. And I think I'll start us off in the takeaways by saying that tonight we saw the power of San Siro and it was a huge factor in this result. It's the sort of game Watching it on television, I can safely say that I wish I wish I had been there. You could sort of feel the atmosphere coming through the TV screen. You, you could hear the crowd. You can hear how partisan and how loud and how ferocious it is and how it, you could see how it was affecting the players, which was really, really special. And you could also see what an impact it had because Milan were absolutely horrific for like the first 15 minutes. Like they were really, really poor. They should have been 1-0 down after a minute. Their football was super sloppy for the first 10 to 15. They played at a glacial pace, to be honest with you. And it, it took the crowd to really actually wake them up and bring them into the game. It was almost like the crowd reminded the team that they were playing a Champions League quarterfinal, dragged them kicking and screaming into it. And what it took was the Rafa Leal run, where he beats three players. Uh, he's, got, he's got players like hanging off him as he surges forward like he does. And he comes within a whisker of scoring. And that, that's the moment. That's the catalyst. And San Siro wakes up. The crowd are roaring. They go ahead and they get the goal. The second counter-attack is Benacer. Everyone goes absolutely wild. Two minutes later, Teo Hernandez wins a throw off Chucky Lozano. He starts screaming at Lozano. Like, not like shouting at him, but like he's fired up. And he's like, yes! Like, even at winning a throw-in. And Lozano has a couple of words to say to him. And it's at this point I look on Twitter and I, I, there's one person I think was in the stadium, Nikki Bandini, a journalist, tweeted that uh, she could feel the concrete moving, which I hope was, um, was that she was speaking figuratively. Metaphorical. Because that would have been... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I really, I really hope so. But I know what she means. And Carl, Carl Anker as well uh, said, AC Milan just hit the heritage button. Uh, two really nice ways of summing up what we were watching. And then it kind of carries on like Simon Kier waxed the bar with a header. And if you're Milan here, you basically just don't want this half to end. Like you, 
as players, you feel invincible. And we talk about this concept quite a lot, but rarely do you see it um, with such effervescence. And, you know, there are certain players in this Milan team who very clearly thrive on emotion. And when they get charged up, they, they, they level up. And I was, I was going to make this its own takeaway, but I think we can, we can sort of crowbar it in here because we've got a lot to talk about. But Davide Calabria put in the shift of his life this evening, the shift yeah. of his life. You know, I mean, Cavara wasn't terrible, not, not by a long shot, but you could probably say that Calabria just about held him at bay, which is almost impossible. Um, and this, I don't think this, this can happen if San Siro aren't there to charge Davide Calabria up and roar him all the way across the finish line. I mean, Cavara came off in the 80th minute. It's to do with the red card partially, which we can come to later. But imagine being Calabria and putting in that performance and watching Cavara leave the pitch. You must feel the most incredible sense of self-satisfaction at your night's work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. I, and I was going to say, look, I don't know what your other two takeaways are here, but if one of them is about the refereeing decisions that were made in this one, um, then I think that that would feed into this because I think there's something about San Siro tonight that, that maybe had an effect on some of the officiating. I've seen some things on Twitter that have gone so far to say that did Milan pay the ref? I think that's probably a stretch, if <laughs> no, I'm being no. perfectly honest with yeah, you. Yeah. Um, but when when you're looking at some of these decisions, I think it's impossible to look at the fact that San Siro was so loud and so vociferous, um, that the Milan players were so pumped up that they were around the ref at all points and struggled to come to the idea that some of the decisions made and some of the decisions made that will affect the second leg, the Kim yellow card, the second Angisi yellow card. If this is played at the Maradona, I don't think those two decisions get made and they're two decisions that are m massive in terms of the second leg. They are. Yeah, they are. I mean, we'll, we'll save that. We'll save that for that. We'll revisit that um, for later. Um, but the refereeing, I mean, yeah, my commentary stream here in the UK didn't necessarily like the refereeing. Thought it was a bit one-sided towards Milan. I'd say maybe a little bit, but probably not as bad as maybe Twitter would, would have you believe at points. But we'll we'll, yeah. we'll 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 revisit that in a little bit. Um, because my second takeaway here is that last 10 minutes aside, obviously based off the red card, I feel like Milan reached a point in the second half where they decided to settle for one nil. And you could tell in their play that they thought this will do. And I think that's quite a massive mistake. And they did kick back into gear a little bit once the red card had been handed out because they were obviously a man up and San Siro was demanding that they they basically pour forward and try to score. Rebic was relatively handy um, as a sort of impact sub and Salamakas tried to make things happen. Like they freshened it up and you know what? They weren't too far off probably scoring a second at points. But before that red, which basically informed the way they wanted they should play, they, I'm pretty sure they said to themselves, what we have, we hold. And their intensity dropped all the way off around the 70-minute mark. And the game became very scrambled. I sat there thinking, guys, you're not 3-0 up, you're 1-0 up. And mm. you're against Napoli. And you go into the Maradona. W what are you playing at? What are you doing? And they did buck up a little bit, obviously. But it was only because of the red. And they still only came out of it 1-0. So I'm a little bit confused there as, as to how they can... I don't know, like they, they kind of laid siege to Napoli's goal at points through the first 60 minutes. I mean, Napoli had their, their fair share of shots too, but uh, when, the, when, the, when the blood was pumping, Milan were on it. You know, they should have been hunting and hunting and hunting and, and they definitely just went, uh, this is all right for us at some point. I thought it was a bit weird. Did you get the same sense? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a slightly different. My, my, I would have never said that... Napoli's goal was under siege for more than sort of two, three minutes at a time. Mm. Um, the Kier header and that little part of the game right at the end of the first half, uh, as good as it got, I thought, for Milan. But it just felt like Napoli had control. That said, it did feel like Milan were like, come on then, what have you got? Without Aussie men, we're not scared of you. And I wonder if that's part of this, because if they think that they can hold, you know, Napoli out at the Maradona, obviously they went there and won 4 0 recently in the league. It's not going to be the same game in this second leg, sure. But that's two games in a row that they've held Napoli to not scoring. Now, obviously, they owe part of that to Mike Mignon, who made a couple of excellent saves. There was a little bit of wasteful finishing from Napoli's perspective, I think. But generally, I think they'll look at it and go, okay, two games, not conceded, scored five. 
we can go there and we can do a job on them. And that's, I suppose, why the intensity dropped off. Because they're, at that point, I think you're right in terms of they could have drilled for it and opened the game up. I think that is a risky manoeuvre considering how good Napoli were in the first 25, 30 minutes um, of this game, where I really did think the false nine and Spalletti's manoeuvres took Pioli's tactics out of the game, to be honest, until there is that first chance on the break and then the goal. I thought that Napoli were majorly in the ascendancy in this one and probably unlucky not to be one, if not two nil mm. up at that point. So at least one, I think yeah. there's an element of that. We're like, do we want to open this back out properly? Because that's a scary proposition with this Napoli side. Mm. And that's why I can understand them dropping in. And I can also understand them dropping in going, when we sit in like this, you can't get through us. And, and, and I did feel that element of that Milan performance. Yeah, but Mike Mignon was still pretty busy, wasn't he? I mean, uh, yeah, they're playing with fire here, uh, letting Napoli back into the game, even in the last 10 minutes where they had a couple of shots. I quite liked the sort of uh, the playful push that Di Lorenzo gave Mignon in about the 87th minute, where Mignon tips one over the bar and and, and um, Di Lorenzo just goes and goes, oh, you're, it, was a, it was a, you're so annoying kind of push. It was yeah. it was actually yeah, lovely yeah, to yeah. see. Uh, just really Can you not? Um, yeah, come on, mate. I'm doing my best here. Stop it. <laughs> but um, look, it, it kind of it kind of brings us to the final point here, where like this 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 basically went about as badly as you can imagine for Napoli. I think um, they missed a golden chance in the first minute, and Gisa was sent off and is suspended for the second leg. Kim Min Jae was booked. He's suspended for the second leg. The team lost. The players lost their heads. Like Rachmani there at the end, shoving Salamakas over for because he thinks it's a dive pushing him in the back and pushing him over and getting booked for it. And then, you know, going forehead to forehead with him. It a lot was of it was just like, for it's worth. like, yeah, it was, it was, but um, you know, he pushed a man over from behind because he was annoyed with him. And it, it was just a bit like oh, the frustrations are obviously boiling over. So I kind of want to say that this went about as badly as it, as it, as you can imagine for Napoli, but because it, it sets them off on a poor footing for the second leg. You know, Ossiman's going to be another question, and Gisa and Kim are missing. You look at these three players; they've obviously struggled lately without Ossiman. But over the earlier in the season, they were they sort of coped without him okay. But Kim Min Jae has missed one game this season in Serie A and the Champions League, and it was Spezia at home, and they won it. Obviously, um, he's missed one game. They're not used to playing without him, and and Gisa's only missed three. Uh, I think a couple in Serie A and one in the Champions League against Rangers. These are very, 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 very important players. And one of the really important parts of Napoli's um, momentum this season has been that they have been able to send, you know, the same seven key players out very, very often. So we're sort of heading into, a, you know, unknown territory here for Napoli. You know, Maradona, only one nil down. Ossiman might be back. That's the blue sky option. The other side of the coin is, well, they've just lost to this team 4-0. Now they've lost to them 1-0. Kim's suspended. He's your defensive leader. And Geese is suspended. He's an important cog in midfield. Are they going to be all right? <laughs> mm. It's difficult, isn't it? Um, I, I think, obviously, Ndombele comes in for Angeese, so which is... Fine. It's not necessarily yeah. you know that much of a problem. And Gisa's great trait is carrying the ball. I think Ndombele is also a good progressor of, of the football yeah. when he's in, in possession. So that one should be a pretty like for like. And we've seen that swap happen time and time again over the course of this season, if not at the beginning of games, as you point out, very much at 60, 70 minutes. So yeah, that one feels like it sorts itself out. Kim in J1 is is really hard. Juan Jesus comes in. I mean, what you'll say by that is that at least it's not a really fast striker he's going to come up against because that man has lost his turn of pace if he ever had one. Um, but, you know, there, there is question marks to be had about how the rest of the seven heads respond to that. I think that Rachmani's level this season has gone up so much by playing next to a player like Kim in J who's able to marshal the line so well. Jesus has that experience, fine. But, can he make sure that it makes sense in the context of this game? Who knows? Um, maybe he comes up trumps. Maybe he doesn't. And and these are things you don't really want to be playing with. For what it's worth, I think Kim's yellow card was absolute nonsense. And it's one of those things that goes back to exactly what we were talking about before, about the ref losing control of this game and losing control of where he stood in terms of, of Napoli in particular, I think. 
Yeah, and just the, the sheer amount of stoppages as well. Um, the, the, it, he just blew his whistle an awful lot, and it was just annoying everybody. Like, it was annoying me, and it was definitely annoying the players. Um, but obviously, if you're the team that's 1-0 down rather than 1-0 up, you don't appreciate it when any kind of momentum is stymied. And, oh, no, 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 we'll just stop the game again. And, oh, I'll just have a quick word with you. The amount of times he pulled two players in, just to have a word. You don't need to speak to them. Stop, stop it. <laughs> Get on with it. Stop it. it. Get on with the game. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Indeed. Right. We are running long, so let's keep moving and let's go to yesterday's games. We're going to start with Benfica losing 2-0 at home to Inter at the Estadio de Luz uh, before we finish with City's demolition job uh, on Bayern Munich. And I have three points for you on Benfica Inter, which didn't go as many of us expected. It was not the game that we thought this one was going to be. Um, but I'm going to start. Actually, it's three Bs. How about that for you? Three Bs are my three takeaways. I'm going to start with three, which was Bastoni, who was sublime going both ways in this game. Now, he creates the two key opportunities in this game. One, the first one for Barella, who heads home, an absolutely beautiful cross. And the pass to pick this out is absolutely sensational. Bear in mind that Barella is five foot seven, five foot eight. He's about my height. Mm. And this is not a man who you're looking to pick out in the box in a, in a crowded penalty area, which has the likes of Antonio Silva, has Morato in it. There is a lot of height in this area. And suddenly Bastoni has spotted that not only is Barella running in late and free, um, getting away from that Benfica midfield, which we pointed out in our preview. But the fact that he's got that space and he's managed to lift it over the big lads in order to land it on the little lad's head. Just a sublime pass, a little wave of that left wand from Bastoni. Now, we've talked about his long passing on ranks here before, but I just mm, thought that yeah. generally yesterday, he sets up another one later on with Dumfries, which probably should be the second goal. It's about a minute before the penalty gets given. Um, and it's another delightful ball from centre-back. But also, in the absence of Skriniar, I really thought that Bastoni stepped up defensively. He was the one that handled Gonzalo Ramos for a lot of this game. I thought he was the one calling the defensive lines. You could see it. And for such a young player to step up with Skriniar absent, who's clearly the kind of natural leader of this pack, to step up and be that defensively solid against a side that have been, to be honest, pretty irresistible through the entire game. To keep a clean sheet at the Luz is no mean feat whatsoever. Mm. Very, very few teams have managed that this season. And you look at what Inter did yesterday in terms of stifling them. And look, we're going to talk about the fact that Benfica had defensive issues and had rotations in that defence. This was not a particularly rotated attack. It was the attack that Benfica have been running with for the entirety of the season. It's the attack that Benfica have been running riot with all season. And Bastoni was the forefront of this being absolutely sublime. So I've just got to give props where it's due. Bastoni, absolutely brilliant yesterday. Yeah, we. Uh, he's he's a gifted passer for sure. Um, the the long the long raking balls. You know, he, he and Barella have had this connection for years now, haven't they? Um, it goes back to their title winning season. It goes back to Conte. The way he gets under that ball and 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 lifts it 60, 70 yards, it looks almost effortless. It's really really impressive. I saw a couple of inter inter fans tweeting about this. Uh, I can't tell if it's Alessandro Bastoni or David Beckham, the way he's sending these balls in from the flank. I mean, it, it, it really he it really is genuinely one of the best the out left there. At the, long, at the long ranger. Yeah, the left-footed Italian centre-back version of Beckham. <laughs> All right, fine. Maybe they went too far. But still, very, very talented in that area. So good to see. Yeah, absolutely. A lovely footballer. Um, and nice to see him doing is some good work defensively as well. We've, we've known about the passing for a long time, but um, make himself into an all-round defender is, is really lovely. Um, my second point is that Benfica wilted under the lights yesterday, and this is the second time in five days that Benfica have wilted in a bright light. Now, we've talked about this team, and we've talked about them in glowing terms all year, and we've talked about the Roger Schmidt's influence on them, the fact that they've been far and away the best team in the Primeira. We've got to the business end of the season, and there are two kind of theories that you can posit with this. One is that they started at such a brilliant intensity that maybe that is just starting to run dry a little bit against teams to have maybe kept themselves in reserve a little bit more this season, who play a little bit more 
compact and, and, and less expansively than Benfica have done for the entire campaign. And maybe they're just a little bit exhausted. This wouldn't be the first time we've seen this. I think there's an element of this with Napoli, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. But we're seeing these teams who have been so much fun throughout the whole season, beaten by teams who are just able to sit in a little bit deeper, who are able to soak up possession and to hurt you when it comes to taking their chances. Um, the second theory is that this Benfica side are young, inexperienced, in these big moments and at the moment the bright lights are just shining a little bit too brightly uh, in, in that regard now i don't think it's going to stop them winning the pre-made there's seven clear with seven to go and um, there's only two tricky games really left in their calendar if you look at one against sporting and, uh, and one against braga i think they'll have enough to see it over the line in, in, in a domestic sense but I don't think they'll have enough to turn this tie around. Uh, the <laughs> well, it's the Giuseppe Meazza when when into play there, is it not the San Siro? So I don't think that Benfica have the ability. Well, I think they have the ability. I don't think they have the temperament to actually get the better of this. And there's a moment here in the 94th minute where they race through on goal. Ramos races through on goal. The one person you want it to to fall to. And his effort is so tame, so tame, and it's dealt with really comfortably. And that's the kind of game, obviously, it's not going to change the result. But going from a 2-0 deficit to a 1-0 deficit is the kind of thing that could completely swing the momentum of a tie and also completely change the fact that Inter would have felt like they were coasting and suddenly they've got a team breathing down their necks who have that momentum with them going into the next game. And I think those moments are massive. There was just a couple of them. There was a goal mouth scramble, which is the kind of thing that has been going into the back of the net. Rafa Silva had a big chance early on that Anana did really well with. And this Ramos chance late on. And I was just looking at it going, Two months ago, I think Benfica would have scored those chances, won this game 3-1. And when you when you compare that to what we're seeing here and what we saw in the Clasico against Porto, I just genuinely think that they might have just run out of steam a little bit. And the fact that the lights just feel a little bit bright for them with, with the young side not used to being at this end of the competition in this manner. Yeah, I can definitely buy into the idea that they are flagging physically and it's it's just you know we, we've ticked into we're ticking into mid-april and it's just taking its toll you know the the style that roger schmidt uh instructs is very very intense as we know and we know that his teams will eventually sort of start to flag it's pretty classic red bull model and you know you're looking at this this, this performance and you know that the guys that have played all season the guys that have shone all season are really struggling and then you've got someone like Chiquinho, who's looking all right in midfield actually. Um, and David Neres is, is, is looking pretty fresh, you know, when he steps off the bench. And um, I saw someone say, oh, Morato, Morato's doing surprisingly well. Yeah, none of these three have played any football. <laughs> like, they're the only three on the pitch in a Benfica shirt that haven't been flogged and flogged. <laughs> and I genuinely think that supports the theory that unfortunately, they are just a bit tired. And as we've been talking about all show, and as we always do on these occasions, and as Dean has referenced this evening, like if you don't have that intensity, if you're not 100% at it at this level, at this stage of the competition, you will quickly find yourself on the wrong end of the margins. And what you've just described to me checks out. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I mean, there are margins and then there are margins. So my first point, and I'm delighting being able to say this again, Varela is back as one of the best midfielders in Europe. These are the kind of performances that I think he's had a pretty mediocre season by his own standards not a problem but just not quite to the level that we've seen of him in recent years but I genuinely thought that Nicolo Barella was almost unplayable in this game he was able to do everything both ways he was back making tackles on the edge of his box he was running with the ball through the Bonfica midfield uh, and kind of jumping into those areas he was getting on the end of crosses he was not taking knockdowns of Dzeko and Lautaro he was able to link the play and just all of it felt like I was watching a player back in his prime Barella loves these occasions we've seen him turn up and turn it on at Barcelona at Camp Nou, right? We've seen him turn it up and turn it on in the big games in Serie A. And he came here in a game where I think many had ends up pegged as real underdogs. And he took the game by the scruff of its neck because I think that Lautaro, who is very much the, you know, the, the end of talisman in inverted commas, felt like he didn't really have, he had another one of those games where it was a bit like, yeah, okay, Lautaro is here. He's not doing much. Varela was just like, nah, don't worry, I got it. And, and when Varela does that, He's so difficult to play against. And 
I just love watching him in this kind of form because I do think that generally he's one of the most talented footballers in Europe. And I think he's one of the best midfielders in Europe. When he has games like this, I think he just reminds everyone of that fact a little. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. He's, um, I mean, I've got distinct memories of Barella turning up in big games. As you kind of mentioned, he's, he's had a few good ones. The Serie A, like he's crushed Juventus like multiple times, seemingly almost single-handedly. He was an absolute star under Conte in the title winning season. Like like the rest of them, a little bit of a dip recently, I'd say. There's a, there was a bit of a post-Euros dip, I think, for a lot of these kind of players after they won it. Um, and But Barella, it does seem to be sort of crawling back to it, which is which is... Uh, well, lovely to see for us because we're great fans of him. Not great if you're Benfica. And, you know, you you did you did point this out in the preview. You said, look, Benfica tried to commit bodies forward on the left. They tried to overload and rotate. Grimaldo is a huge part of this. Otamendi is suspended. Will they be able to deal with the sort of runs Barella makes? Apparently not. Apparently it was the difference. So uphill, I guess. It's, an, it's a seriously uphill battle for this Benfica side now. Yeah, I mean, look, they have the talent to do it. And if, if there's an early goal, uh, the Miyatsa, then nothing is ruled out with this side. They have the ability to, as we've seen, to go to difficult places and score three, four goals. And we've seen it in the Champions League this season. I just wonder if the intensity has dropped off as much as it did in this game, if that's going to be possible against the crowd, against all of it, and with Inter looking relatively comfortable. It's going to be very, very interesting, this second leg. Um Let's take it to our final game, which was Manchester City 3, Bayern Munich 0. Now, this second leg has less intrigue because this was comprehensive, Sam. It really was. Um, wow. Just wow, I think. Uh, what an outstanding performance from Manchester City and a number of their players. And, and what an outstanding performance from Pep Guardiola as well, you know. To beat Bayern Munich 3-0 is some achievement for literally anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. You could have the pedigree of Real Madrid in this competition. You could have won it four times in a row. If you beat Real, if you beat Bayern Munich 3-0 in the Champions League, then you deserve a round of applause and then some. And so for City to go and do this and in the process prove a lot of people wrong or maybe make a lot of people think twice is maybe the more accurate way of putting it. Very, very impressive. I'll start us off on the takeaways by saying that John Stones is the man. He is the man. John Stones is the man. Put him in charge of everything. The country, the world, the universe, I don't care. He can do it all. Clearly, he is capable of literally anything. He was man of the match in a game where Man City scored three, where Bernardo Silva ran rings around Fonzie Davies, where Rodri dominated a midfield of Goretzka and Kimmich and scored a left-footed curler from outside the box. It was a game where Ruben Diaz stood tall, Ake was nearly perfect, and Grealish was an absolute terror. I, I could literally cover the whole team. And yet John Stones yeah. is man of the match. He was the best player. And this is very significant, I think, because, again, in the preview, we asked the question, OK, Stonesy, playing your hybrid right back, centre back, midfield role. Absolutely loving it against the Liverpool side who are very weak in midfield this season and obviously very good against Southampton who are bottom of the league. What about Bayern? What about this midfield? What about this opponent? What about one of the best pressing and most physical sides that you can come up against on one of the most important possible nights? Yes, 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 yes. All ticks. Stonesy absolutely bossed it. Assist, clean sheet, Defensive recovery work to die for. Smoothness in possession. Wasn't phased, wasn't fussed when Kimmich and Goretzka are hunting him down, when Sané and Gnabry are trying to enact a press. Honestly, you squint you squint your eyes, mate, so you can't quite see, you know, exactly, you can't quite see the back of his head. And you just wonder maybe if you're watching Sergio Busquets instead or something like it. It's just outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. I'm flabbergasted. I shouldn't be, but I really thought that he would against Bayern Munich, at least struggle a little bit to do this incredibly complex role? No. So what you're saying is Busquets-esque, Barnsley, Beckenbauer, Burns, Bavarians <laughs> badly. <laughs> I very much am, yeah. I very much am. Fantastic. So that's my cat's tail in the weight of the webcam. Um, <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. John Stones is the man. Let's move us on to point number two. Day up and Mikado is not the man. 
<laughs> it's just not. No. And this one really, really hurts, mate. This one really hurts. I had just come around to him. As you know, for years, I've been skeptical and I've been very cautious. I've had my concerns, you know, rash defensive style, risky play. I just let him win me over. And then he drops this. It's it's an absolute nightmare. It's like it's a two out of 10 performance. He's made mistake after mistake after mistake. They've compounded. He's lost his composure. He's made more mistakes. Absolutely dreadful. Um, credit to Man City, obviously, for forcing the mistakes and putting him into that into that bind. You know, absolutely incredible. Um, There's a really good thread on Twitter analyzing the kind of pressing tweaks that Pep Guardiola made in the second half, using Jack Grealish to really unnerve Upper Makano and force him into these problems and these errors. But my God, I don't like to throw the term around, Jack, but it was a disaster class, absolute disaster class. And by the end of the game, he looked like a shell of a human being. It was genuinely remarkable. Hmm. Mm, yeah, it, it was it was real bad. And it felt even worse considering we discussed the fact that Canate and Ibrahimakano and he he kind of caught up to Canate and then suddenly he did that. <laughs> and it was like, oh no, he's gone again. I'm gonna sum your kind of sum your point up though, in uh by saying that what you're saying is dreadful diet drops dreary dismal disaster cars. Um <laughs> we're uh, we're really rolling today. <laughs> What's in yes, number we three? Are. That's, um, oh. It was it was really tough. It was really tough to watch. I, you don't like to see it, but let's finish off by saying that this was not just an Upper Meccano problem. Um, this was a Bayern Munich problem. And I will say that my final takeaway is that I don't think I've ever seen Bayern collapse like that. And I don't think I've ever seen them bullied like that, which is possibly the more concerning part from me, because I do think that so much of the strength of this Bayern Munich team is harnessing that intensity and that speed of play that we've been talking about that really sets sets the elite ones apart. And I really feel like their superpower this this season, which was you know integral to beating Barcelona twice, Inter Milan twice, and PSG twice, was their midfield that could not be beaten, could not be unnerved, could not be ruffled. And they were awful. They were made to look really quite poor for most of the game. Kimmich had a really good half an hour. First half an hour. Goretzka couldn't really find, really couldn't find it at all. And by the end, obviously, the entirety of Bayern Munich's team looked terrible, except for Jan Sommer. They they completely collapsed and completely crumbled. I'm stunned by this. I'm genuinely stunned. You know, the mentality of Bayern is one thing. The, the maturity is another. The physicality is a third element. And it all deserted them. So what does that mean? <laughs> How how does that paint Man City? Like what? How do we have to look at it? Look at look at Bernardo Silva there, tussling away and getting the better of Fonzi. How many nutmegs did he manage in a row? Three, four. I mean, we're losing count. Yeah, it was, it was, struggling it was, it was uncomfortable at times. Yeah, absolutely. You got up in Makano with his head in his hands. You look at Coman's face there, Jack. Second half, Kingsley Coman's face when once again he has failed to generate even half a yard of space to get away from Nathan Ake. He can't believe mm. it. Kingsley Coman is like, you can't beat Kingsley Coman for pace. He always gets around you. He always hits the byline. He always gets something. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Sané took a few long shots. He looked all right at times, but couldn't really get into the game. But again, it was like, what? Um, is this like a, is this the real Bayern Munich? Is this an imposter set? So we must, must therefore deduce that Manchester City were truly, truly incredible. Because to make this Bayern team, to make this club, collapse like that is something else yeah yeah, yeah. It, it was it was single-minded wasn't it from manchester city it just felt like they were driving in the same direction throughout and obviously pep came out and said there were worries about it afterwards but but just generally what i felt about it was the, the relentless nature of that performance and the fact that you know every single time it came back at bayern you know, it felt like if it had been five there wouldn't have been much to complain about. I think maybe 5-1. Like, would have been, you, know, you look at it and you go, okay, fine. Yeah. By, to say Bayern were lucky to come out of Manchester with a 3-0 loss is something that I would didn't think I'd be saying today, but that's the truth of the matter. That's that's where we're at. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, but Bayern had a couple of chances. Um, they had one of the first half, really nice one, actually, didn't they? But like, how many did City miss, you know, in response? And, Erling Haaland looked for a while like he wasn't going to score. In fact, I think 
he sort of thought that he wasn't going to either, which is why he ended up cross, crossing that ball and assisting one of the goals. Fantastic stuff. Just an incredible performance. Was- I mean, you say single-mindedness. I think I think that's a good way to put it. Um, I'd say they smelt blood, you know, and they just went for it and went for it and went for it. And they got enough goals. They did what I kind of wanted AC Milan to do, but I understand that Milan couldn't really hit that current, that vein. Um, uh, slightly different, but man, relentless, single-minded, incredible, absolutely incredible. Bravo, Man City. Like, bravo. That is one hell of a performance. One of the best performances I've ever seen in a Champions League latter stages, and it deserves nothing but praise. Mm, absolutely. It's Manchester molten machine melts miserable Munich or something like that. <laughs> so you just spent the entire time I'm talking just thinking those up. <laughs> no, I, they just come to me naturally. I don't, uh, I don't, wow. I don't worry about them. Uh, that's how I'm still able to engage with you, Sam, and talk about things r- r- alongside you, if you will. Um, but on that bombshell, I think it's probably time for us to call it a day. So all there's left for me to do is to say thank you so much for watching here on YouTube. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you very much to Dean Jones for his early cameo on this episode. Thank you so much to the rank god, Mr. Sam Tai. Cheers, buddy. I've been Jack Collins. This has been your Champions League takeaway here on Ranks FC. We hope that you've enjoyed yourself and we hope that we will see you very shortly. There will be a UE Ultras up tomorrow talking all things Europa League. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel not to miss that. And we'll be back obviously next week to preview and review all the Champions League things all over again. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you soon.